I ask your prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want to begin this morning by offering a defense of Nicodemus. I am a Nicodemus sympathizer. He has been much maligned over the millennia. John of Patmos in the book of Revelation warned the churches in Asia to be aware of the Nicolaitans, Christians who publicly worshiped pagan gods in order to go unnoticed by Emperor Domitian's boogeymen. In the 16th century, John Calvin called the silent sympathizers of the Reformation Nicodemites when they wouldn't dare speak the truth about how the Roman church needed to change. Fear of reprisal? Wait and see how things will shake out? I get it. We all want someone else to stick their neck out. Or in the case of a 15th century heretic, be burned at the stake. The dictionary defines a Nicodemite as a person suspected of publicly misrepresenting their religious faith to conceal their true beliefs. It's difficult to think that Nicodemus's namesake slur is apt at this juncture in the gospel. Jesus has only turned water into wine and cleansed the temple. But it's also true that he came to Jesus under dark of night, seeking answers from the teacher he believes is sent from God. Is he having to skulk around in clandestine encounters because he is a powerful, respected Pharisee, fearful of being a traitor to his fellow religious authorities, in particular the Sanhedrin Council? Of course. Nicodemus could not arrest Jesus, but once accused and arrested, he held the power of life and death over him. But is he a coward, unwilling to profess the truth as he understands it? I'm not so sure. Perhaps a clue to Nicodemus's motives lies in the two chapters immediately preceding our text. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. I'm going to go out on a limb and state that Jesus knew what was in Nicodemus's heart. He knew from their first meeting that Nicodemus would never deny or desert him. He knew that Nicodemus was not damning him with faint praise or to hell. Commentators over the years have done a real number on Nicodemus, throwing him under the bus, making him out as the poster child for presumption, painting him as a bumbling, pompous Pharisee, a foolish foil for the wisdom of Jesus. They claim his befuddlement mocks Jesus. I don't buy it, and this is why. By the end of verse 9, where Nicodemus is plaintively asking, how can these things be? I'm not thinking to myself, geez, guy, how could you not get this? I'm thinking, dude, I'm just as lost as you are. So let's replay what happens. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and he makes a statement. We know you are the teacher sent from God. This is true because no one can do what you do apart from God. Jesus replies with a comment 
that has nothing to do with Nicodemus's statement. It doesn't even make logical sense. Nicodemus points this out. Jesus replies with a comment that makes less sense and helpfully tells Nicodemus not to be astonished. Astonished, Nicodemus replies, how can this be? This is hardly an interrogation. The Episcopal priest and writer, Barbara Brown Taylor, has written and lectured extensively on this very back and forth between these two. Rather than be critical of the fact that their conversation took place in the shadows, Taylor proclaims that a new life actually starts in the dark. Whether it is a seed in the ground, a baby in the womb, Jesus in the tomb, it starts in the dark. To understand Nicodemus, she posits, we have to know the work of the 15th century polymath, the philosopher, mathematician, and theologian, Nicholas of Cusa. In his work on learned ignorance, Cusa identifies three groups of ignorant people in their search for God. Okay, here's the first group. Those who do not know that they do not know. You with me? Those who do not know that they do not know. This category of folk speaks of God as easily as they speak of the weather and what they had for lunch. They can tell you exactly what Jesus meant by being born from above and where the wind will blow next. Because they trust in their own wisdom, they are shut off from the wisdom of God. Now the second group, those who know that they do not know, but think that they should know. Those who know that they do not know, but think that they should know. Okay, so when these folk see through a glass dimly, they think they need cataracts or a new window, or cataract surgery. They are enthusiastic converts eager to discover all aspects of their spirituality. They walk labyrinths and attend every retreat offered. They buy every book that promises to help them break through whatever is keeping them on the wrong side of the glass. In their mid-level ignorance, they do not know where the wind comes from or where it goes, but they think that they should. Okay. And now that third group. Those who know that they do not know, but receive this ignorance as God's own gift. Those who know what they do not know, but receive this ignorance as God's own gift. Certainty about God is no longer what they're after. It's intimacy that they desire. In their state of illumined ignorance, they do not know where the wind comes from or where it goes, but they can live with that because they trust that God does. So think about this. Which category best describes you and why? I'm just going to leave that there. This, my friends, is the category in which Nicodemus finds himself. And I think why Jesus doesn't excoriate him, even though he does challenge him. For Nicodemus, Jesus and his talk of being born from above with water and spirit is elusive. But at that moment, when he realizes that he cannot know, God reaches him from the divine, moving him from uncertainty to vulnerability, to actually desiring an intimate relationship with God. It doesn't happen overnight, and it's not a lightning bolt to the heart. 
You see, our Linton journeys offer us freedom rather than conscription. We are to seek and seek until we finally let go of our understanding, comparative, quantified, or logical. And when we empty ourselves of such lofty ideas of knowing and finally admit ignorance, then we too will find God. Now, Nicodemus appears two more times in John's Gospel. In the seventh chapter, after John has fed the 5,000, walked on water, excuse me, Jesus has fed the 5,000, walked on water, claimed to be the bread of life, Nicodemus' cover is compromised when he defends Jesus to the Sanhedrin who were out to arrest and kill him. Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing, does it? He asserts. And then, after Jesus' crucifixion, Nicodemus shows his true self when he comes out in the light of day, bear, bearing a 100-pound burden of myrrh and aloe. He is there to help Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus down from the cross and carry him to the tomb and anoint his body and wrap him in linen. It is at this tender, heart-wrenching moment that Nicodemus sees the kingdom of God in all of its glory. When he places Jesus' blood-stained body in the tomb, he is newly born from above. Death and rebirth are intractably linked at this very moment. Together with Joseph, he does what needs to be done. Words and thoughts seem to have become superfluous when facing Jesus' body. Silently, they render a service of love. I don't think Nicodemus is meant to stand for us as a symbol of what not to be. Nicodemus is a symbol for who we are, a group of people longing to make sense of things, to be enlightened, but to understand it in our own time with our own imaginations, free from guilt or shame. And I believe Jesus loves us for that just as he loved Nicodemus. But Jesus also knows that sometimes what we really need are not the answers that we crave, but instead to just stand in the darkness and open ourselves to the mystery of God's presence. When Nicodemus let go of what he thought he knew, only when he stopped trying to make Jesus make sense. It's at this moment when Jesus says to Nicodemus these words so beautiful, so profound, that they have become the cornerstone of our faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Amen.